Okay, so this is uh, Sacred Families, uh, subtitle of this uh, series, uh, Developing the Family According to God's Design. This is lesson two. And the title of this one is The Goal of Biblical Marriage. Goal of Biblical Marriage. So in our first session, we reviewed several key ideas related to our overall theme of the uh, Sacred Family. So I want to start with just doing a brief review of that lesson before we uh, keep on going. First uh, main idea that we talked about last time was that a family is truly sacred or set apart by God when it follows the design and the purpose for family according to God's will. You know, family is not just an accident that happened. There's, there's, you know, God's will uh, is working uh, through the family or should be working through the family. So I said that what sets the sacred family apart is that it sees itself as an instrument of God's will in building His kingdom. And not simply a family that wants to be happy or a family that wants to be close or a family that wants to be successful. There's nothing wrong with that. But a sacred family understands consciously that it is a tool for God's purpose. The sacred family, as I said, is aware of this purpose and mission in its overall design. So that was one idea we talked about last time. Second one, I mentioned that the Christian family is a type or a preview of what our heavenly existence will be like. This is why we follow God's design for the family because it's supposed to point to something beyond ourselves. Family is not just there for its own self. It's there to do something for the future. This is one reason why the Bible forbids uh, homosexuality, for example. I mean, I'm not going to go into that topic now, but from the sacred family perspective, uh, gay marriage, not only for the obvious sexual immorality of this activity, you know, people say, well, why is it immoral? Because it's forbidden. If it's forbidden, therefore it's immoral. But also because the gay marriage model does not reflect accurately the ultimate heavenly reality that marriage was designed to do. Now that argument may be lost on a non-believing gay person or gay couple, but it's still a reality. So gay marriage, you know, it may be legal and it may be a union of sorts, even between sincere people who care for each other. I, I, I never debate the idea that two gay people who want to, quote, be married don't have feelings of love for one another, no matter you know, how you see that. I don't say, no, that's not true. You, you know, you're not really fond of that person. Of course not. But it does not fulfill God's function on a spiritual level as a type or a preview for the heavenly experience that we as Christians will have. Another idea. I talked about the basic elements necessary to create a marriage based on the model given to us by God in Genesis. And these elements were, first, knowledge of self. You have to know yourself before you can know somebody else. And remember, last time I talked about, you know, how do we put together you know, a biblical marriage? What does the Bible say you need to have? Notice it doesn't say, well, you need to have enough money to buy a house before you get married, or you need to, it doesn't say, it doesn't talk about those things. It talks about the people. How are they ready for marriage? You have to have knowledge of your partner. You know, the root cause in marriage, of problems in marriage many times, is that couples don't communicate in order to know each other deeply. They know each other superficially, but they don't know each other deeply. A third element in the biblical marriage, commitment to unity. Marriages begin when both partners are committed to being one. And they end when one or both begin to back away from that commitment. A lot of times they say, well, the marriage ended in the divorce court. Well, you know, the divorce court is where you bury it. <laughs> That's where you bury the marriage. But it ends long before you get to the divorce court. It ends or it begins to end as you begin unraveling every bind that binds you together. 
That's why in the Bible, New Testament, when they talked about divorce, they don't, use a, they don't use a legal term for divorce. They use this term called unloosening, to unloosen. It's like a rope that's tied with many knots and you start undoing the knots, you loosen. And it's a great image for what actually takes place when a marriage starts to fall apart. The, on the face of it, everything looks normal. You know, both people are living in the house and they got their kids and the, you know, he goes to work or they both go to work and they pick up the kids after school and they go to mom's uh, you know, on, on Christmas for, for dinner. You know, everything looks okay. But underneath all of that, what isn't seen by anyone on the outside is that both partners are starting to unloosen. They're starting to untie all the little knots that knotted them together as one. They be, they're beginning to undo those undo all those knots and eventually when they're all undone they drift away and like I say by the time you get to the divorce court the marriage is done anyways. And we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in uh, future uh, lessons. So commitment to unity. A lot of times what we say is I'm committed to my partner and what we ought to be saying is I'm committed to the unity that I have with my partner. Okay? That's, that's, uh, if, if that's the understanding that you have about your marriage, then you have a better understanding of marriage when things happen, when, problem, when your partner disappoints you. So you can still be committed to the unity of your marriage even if your partner disappoints you or does something that harms you or hurts you. When, when, when you're committed to the unity of your relationship, you can withstand a lot of those type of things. Now, I'm not saying just, you know, you're a battering ram for abuse or anything like that. I'm just saying you're able to withstand disappointment and other problems when you're committed to the unity. And it's an understanding that both people have. This is our thing. It's our thing. No one else has it, just us, that's our thing, and I'm committed to our thing. And when people talk about, should we do this, should we move to Buffalo, or should we, you know, the, the, the question we should be asking is, never mind how it affects you and the kids, or how it affects me, how does moving to Buffalo affect our thing? And when you, you answer those kind of questions, that, that's when you, you know, you, you're getting realistic answers to how a certain move, a certain decision will affect not just one person, but how, how will it affect your thing, your unity. And then the fourth element, sexual intimacy or uh, oneness. So notice the, uh, notice the building blocks here of uh, biblical marriage. You begin with knowledge of self and you add knowledge of the other person and then comes the commitment to unity, which is, which is the, usually the marriage, right? It's the marriage itself. You commit to unity, meaning you commit to being married to that other person. And then sexual intimacy comes at last. And what I mentioned last week was the problem in our society, the message that goes out on every medium in our society is that we take sexual intimacy and we put that first. <laughs> And we think that sexual intimacy is the thing that's going to help us know the other person that we don't know. And usually that's the problem. We don't get to know someone simply through sexual intimacy. Usually it clouds, you know, it clouds the reality. You know, we're not able to actually know who that other person is because of we've gotten these things in the, uh, in the right order. And when you get these things out of sequence also, uh, relationships tend to, tend to suffer because of, because of that. But anyways, we, we talked about that last week. Just want to give you a little bit of, of a review. So we've laid a bit of uh, groundwork concerning the biblical basis of marriage. These are the building blocks. Most, if not all of you here are married and so you can only look back at your original motives or situations in order to to, um, to compare it to this model. Obviously, a lesson like this is best taught to you know, a group of individuals who are not married. And I used to do this one 
when I was at OC, uh, you know, big, uh, big college there, um, a, a lot of young people uh, engaged while they're in college. And every year they would have a series just for engaged couples. And they would invite different people to come and teach different sections of it. And I had one of the sections to teach and I taught, I think, I think the first and second section is what I taught. And this is some of the material that I showed. You know, you're not married yet. Here's some of the things you need to consider before you, you, know, you get to that point of saying, I do. In this class, obviously, we're kind of looking back and say, well, I wonder if that's what we did. But that's okay, at least you know. Uh, you're here, you're married, many of you with uh, children, uh, into many years of conjugal life. Now what? I mean, what's the purpose, the goal of this marriage here on earth? What's the goal of it? And some people might say, well, you know, we're, to get, we're, we're here to raise a family. Isn't that goal enough? Men, especially if they're the primary earners, well, the goal, well, to provide for my family. I work like a dog to provide for my family. Even a more high-minded person might say, well, we're here to serve God. Our marriage is here to serve God. And yes, all true. But the first and foremost goal of marriage is to love one another for life. Because if you can't love one another for life, all these other things here are not going to happen. If you end up hating your spouse after 14 years, <laughs> you're definitely not going to be serving God with your marriage. Because without love in the marriage, raising a family is just work. And those of you I see out there with toddlers, little kids, babies, it's a lot of work. Without love, there's no motivation to provide for the future or the motivation to provide for the future begins to wane. We start saying to ourselves, why am I doing all of this? Why am I killing myself? Why am I, you know, what am I doing here? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm using up all my energy in my life for what? If there's no love in the marriage. Work is just a drudge. Without love, serving God is a burden or a duty at best. And of course, what I believe, without love, we don't preview heaven's experience. Because if you're in a loveless marriage, there's no way that your marriage can preview for you what heaven will be like. The idea is that marriage, you know, just broadly, is supposed to give you a little taste of what heaven will be like. So if you're in a loveless marriage and miserable, <laughs> You may not want to go to heaven. You know, if this is what heaven is like, man, I, <laughs> I want to go somewhere else. So the biggest lie in our society is not that married people don't love each other, it's that they cannot love each other for life. So you have to accept that you're either going to end up bored or hating each other or drift apart or divorced. Why? Because everything you see out there, that's the scenario. The happiest couples you know, that we see, you know, who are famous and who are supposed to have everything that we might want, you know, they, they have success, they don't have quote money problems, they can get their kids the best education, tutors, whatever. You know, they have nice houses, big vacations. You know, they're the privileged. And you're going, wow, they have all the things that we might want. And after 11 or nine years of marriage, whoops, you know, oh, so-and-so, they're breaking up. You know, and and the, the, the thought that comes into our mind is, if these people who have everything, everything that I think would be worth having, if these people can't remain happy in a marriage, well, how am I going to remain happy in my marriage? I don't have hardly any of the things that these people have. So if my, my point, my reasoning here, if God created marriage to be a lifetime relationship, and He did, I'm convinced that He also provided the element that keeps us glued together for life, which is love. 
In other words, I believe it is God's will that we love one another for life. Because why would He command that we remain married for life, but not give us the one thing that will help us remain married through life, you know, through illness and, and problems and you know, for richer, for poorer, healthy, unhealthy, all the, the only thing that gets us through all of that is that, is that we love one another. Now we could spend an entire series talking only about this one subject, but if I had to choose just one thing to cultivate in my marriage in order to keep love alive and growing for life, it would be communication. That's the thing that I would work on in order to maintain a loving relationship. Almost everything we do within marriage is done within the context of communication. So if we want, have, if we want to have love for life, then the thing to continually work on will be our ability to effectively communicate with our spouse throughout our lifetime. See what I'm saying? It's easy to say, well, you need to be in love for life. If you're in love for life, you'll be able to maintain a marriage for life. A happy one, a productive one. The next question is, yeah, how, how do you do that? What do I work on? And my response to that is, you work on communication. That's what you work on. A Couple of uh, quotes. Communication is to love as blood is to life. No comment needed, speaks for itself. Another one, you can't know anyone unless you communicate with them. You can't love anyone you don't know. Therefore, the depth of love existing between a couple will largely depend on the amount and the depth of their communication. There was a time in the past in my ministry where I used to do a lot more pastoral counseling with couples. I don't do that anymore, uh, not much anymore because of Bible talk and all that. But at that time, one of the biggest complaints, and it's always the woman, not always, but nearly always the woman who comes in first. Then she has to drag that old boy in, you know, <laughs> rope him in and bring him in. You know. Usually, it has happened where the man has come first, but usually it's the woman that comes in. And the number one complaint, okay, the number one complaint all the time, he won't talk to me. <laughs> or, he doesn't listen. <laughs> I talk to him, I explain it, I draw pictures. He, he doesn't listen. It's always about communication. I've never, I've never had a woman come in and say, you know, the problem is he just doesn't want to make love as much as I want to. Uh, no, it's not usually the problem. And very rarely a woman will come in and say, you know, <clears throat> I'd be a lot happier if he just made some more money. I can't understand why he just doesn't take a second job and make some more money. I never, I've never heard that. Not one time have I ever heard a woman, a married woman, come in and complain that her husband didn't make enough money and that was the problem in the marriage. It's always, always, <sighs> he doesn't talk to me. He won't tell me what's wrong. Another quote, uh, this time Proverbs, better is open rebuke than love that is Concealed. In other words, better arguing and disagreement than no communication at all. At least there's a sign of life. Because uncommunicated love is like no love. Might as well be no love. Now the big however, here's the big however, okay? There's an idea that saying I love you is the only way, even the best way, of communicating love. And in our quote audio visual world, you know, television, movies, the internet, we place a great emphasis on oral or visual communication. We think that if it isn't communicated verbally, you know, that we can hear it, then for some reason it hasn't actually been communicated. How many times have you said you loved me? You know, we need to understand that the language of love, 
can be communicated in many different ways, not just by words. So let's talk about that for a moment, shall we? Not just communication in general, but the communication of love. I love you and I'm going to communicate to you that I really do love you. A famous book, Gary Smalley, The Language of Love. He was able to synthesize this whole idea and he kind of you know, broke it down to about five different ways that people can say, I love you. Words, for example, expressions of appreciation or loyalty or affection or love or admiration or attraction. Those are the words of love. You know, without using the word love, but saying, you know, after all these years, even when I'm with you, I always feel better when you're around. Did the person say, I love you? No, but those are words of love. I still think you're hot. After all these years, I still think you're hot. Yeah. You're the best mom these kids could have ever gotten. Words, I appreciate you. I love your cooking. I appreciate, you know, I don't get around, I don't do the lawn and you do all that heavy lifting and you sweat out there mowing and trimming and making our place look nice and everything. And I appreciate that. Love. Gifts, tokens of love and appreciation, things you buy, things you make. Always appreciated a card that my wife actually made herself. She likes crafts and things like that. The cards that she actually made herself always were special to me. Actions or service. Actions to please and to comfort the other person around the house or for the family. The caring for someone else's possessions. Service. That's saying I love you. Time. Giving attention, giving lots of attention, quantity of time, listening, deep listening. I'm listening and I'm hearing you. Watching, what do kids do all the time? Daddy, watch me, watch me now. We're gonna, I, I learned how to do the, you know, the cartwheel at school, watch me. You know. No, no, I didn't get it right this time, Daddy. Uh, wait, 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 I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do it again, now watch me. Well, 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 what's the kid saying? Do you love me? <laughs> That's what he's saying. Do you love me? Because if you do, you're going to watch me. You're going to let me do this thing and, 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 and tell me that I'm OK. Obviously, you're not telling your wife, watch me as I do a cartwheel, but you know. <clears throat> Physical. Physical affection, of course, touching, holding, sexual intimacy, and everything that that includes. Now Gary Smalley in his book, Language of Love, tells us that one of these, one of these things here, is our primary language for love. In other words, one of these is our hot button that satisfies our need to know that we are loved. You understand what I'm saying? One of these things here, every, everybody can receive love and, and, and express love through these different ways, but one of these for each one of us is our hot button. In other words, if that button doesn't get pressed, if, if, if actions is the way that you know, we, we, need to be, uh, we need to be told that we're loved, if that button doesn't get pressed, it's not, that we, it's not that we don't hear the expressions of love in other ways, but we don't know that we're loved. I got to know that I'm loved. I, I, I don't know that I'm loved just because you tell me, what's the matter with you? Don't, of course I love you. That does not convince me that you love me. If you're getting mad at me because I need more expressions of love from you and you're getting mad at me because of that. What's the matter with you? you know. That person there, that little scenario, that person is saying, you haven't loved me in the way that I need to be loved. And it's not my fault that I need to be loved in that way. I'm just wired that way 
for whatever, uh, whatever reason. Usually when love dies, not the marriage, that takes a little longer, but usually when married, uh, love dies, it's because we're no longer sure that we love or are being loved. We haven't been convinced by our partner. So we can express or receive all of these things, but usually, as I said, one of these is the one that convinces us that we are loved, and if it isn't pressed, we will not feel love, no matter what the other person says or does. In other words, if you talk to me in my language of love, then I will feel loved. Very important. So let me give you some uh, examples here um, about the language of love in action. All right, little scenario. So the wife's hot button, okay, uh, for knowing she is love is words, okay? Poems, love notes, saying sweet things, compliments on her looks, confessions of desire, the repeated words of love, that's her hot button, words. The husband, on the other hand, he grew up in a house where his dad was the strong, silent type. No fancy words in his house. And the husband has grown up like his dad in this way. But he has learned to say I love you through actions, generous service. So he fixes her car and he takes care of the house and he does a lot of repair work for her elderly parents. Okay. Now what tends to happen here is that she will not feel loved because he's not expressing it in the way that she needs it expressed. In other words, she needs words, not a new muffler on her car. So she will question his love and he will point out all of the things that he does for her. But she will not be satisfied because he's not speaking to her in her language of love. This is how affairs begin. This is how affairs begin. Because somebody at work all of a sudden, even not consciously, but starts pressing your hot button. Let's say this guy's hot button, like we say in our little scenario here, is service, right? Somebody at work starts doing, somebody of the opposite sex, starts doing little things for him. Hey, on break, I, oh, I noticed you were working here and I was on break, I thought I'd bring you a coffee. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Here, let me just finish that up for you because I know your kid is sick and you need to go. Just leave the report with me. I'll take care of it, it'll be ready tomorrow. Ah, oh, you're sweet, thank you. See what I'm saying? That little hot button, even if it begins innocently, is starting to be pressed. And it's magnified 10 times, why? Because at home, that hot button is not being pressed. That's how, that's how affairs start. Now, an interesting feature about this language of love business. People tend to receive their love messages in the same way that they give their love messages. So let's go back to our couple and see how this works. Remember, she receives love through words. So this is usually the way she gives it. And he gives through action and service. So this is usually the way he receives or recognizes love as well. So in a situation like this, she tells him she loves him. She gives him mushy birthday cards. She wants to talk about their relationship. However, she's not interested in hanging out in the garage with him or working on projects together. Oh, I don't want to get my hands dirty. He needs to hear I love you by her involvement with him in his interests and in his things. In the end, he feels smothered by her words, she feels rejected by his silence. And the sad thing, both of them are trying to love, but each is missing the point. And the sad thing is, they don't even realize it. They don't even know it's happening to them, unless they understand these basic things when it comes to communication. So we've looked at a couple of things about the basis for a sacred family, which 
is marriage. First, marriage was conceived by God to be a preview of our heavenly experience. Secondly, marriage DNA is found in Genesis and following God's design for marriage is necessary not only to succeed at it, but also for our marriages to preview that heaven that we're aiming for. Thirdly, the goal that we work towards in marriage is to love each other for life. The goal of marriage is not to pay off the house. The goal of marriage is not to be debt free. The goal, you see, the goal of marriage is not even to get, make sure our kids all go through college. Th those are things that we're shooting for in marriage and wise things. You know, it's wise. Pay off your house as soon as you can, of course. And why shouldn't you expect and, and work towards the best education? You know, I think those are things everybody, there's no parent that doesn't want that. But that isn't the goal of your marriage. The goal in any marriage whether it's a first marriage or a third marriage. The goal is to love your partner. This is what pleases God first and foremost. And this is what energizes you know, reaching the other goals. Because you're not motivated you know, to do all these other things if you're in a loveless marriage. Everything else is a, is a burden. I, I've mentioned this before and a couple of my kids are in this class and so they, they, they'll remember it. I've, I've said to them, I was there with mom before you came and I'm going to be there with mom after you leave. Mom is my first priority, not you. And I'm her first priority, not you. And that's, not, you know, you say, wow, that's awfully selfish, you know? No, because <laughs> as I predicted, they are all gone and married happily and you know, doing well. And who, who's left behind? Well, Lise and I, we're carrying on with our marriage. They were with us for you know, less than half of the time we've been married so far. So in a normal life, you know, people married 40, 50, 60 years, you know, the time their children at home, maybe 20 years, some places 45 years, but then that's, that's that's if you have a basement apartment, but you know what I'm saying. So <laughs> you've, got to have the, you've got to have the right motivation to maintain that, that marriage because you're going to be in it for a long, long, a long, long time. All right. Also, the way to work towards this lifetime goal is to continually improve the communication between the partners. What do I need to work on? I failed at marriage and I'm hoping to be married again one day or I'm in my second marriage or whatever, whatever it is, your situation. You know. How do I avoid making the mistakes that I made in the first one? Yeah, start working on communication. Make sure that that's a priority. And uh, you know, in, in other lessons, actually next uh, lesson, we're going to talk about productive, commu there's communication and then there's productive communication. And so next time I'm going to talk about how to have productive communication in the, in, the, in the couple. But here's your assignment. You have homework. Your homework is discuss with your partner what you think your love language is and what their love language is. Now don't discuss it ahead of time. You know, think about it. What, what, what do I think you know, my wife's love language is and what do I think mine is and she does the same. And make sure the phone is off and the kids are in bed so you can have uh, you know, a bit of a discussion about that. I think uh, it would be very revealing. Okay, that's the lesson for today. Thank you. We appreciate your attendance.